All right, welcome back everybody. Today we are now we have our last presentation of the day. We have Adriana Negron Olivo, the outreach educator with the National Marine Mammal Foundation. And then if you're all ready, you can go ahead and take it away. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. I am very, very excited to introduce a little bit about what I get to do every single day and hopefully inspire you guys to protect the southern resident killer whales um, in the Pacific Northwest. So let's go ahead and get started. I represent the National Marine Mammal Foundation, and we are a nonprofit organization based in San Diego, California. Our mission is to improve and protect life from marine mammals, humans, and our shared oceans. So what that means is that we really are thinking about the entire ecosystem, not only the marine mammals. Um, and we acknowledge that everyone really does have an impact on the ocean. You guys, as you are in Illinois, uh, you do have an impact on the ocean, even though you live very far away from from it. So that is one of our focuses. And today we'll be focusing on the education part of our mission. Uh, this program was created um, with a grant provided by the National Oceana Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, also known as NOAA. And it was made in collaboration with two other organizations aside from the National Marine Mammal Foundation, and that is the Marine Mammal Care Center and the Pacific Mammal Center. And we're very excited to be able to, to show you guys what we have been working very hard to create in the last several months. A little bit about myself. My name is Adriana and I was born and raised in a little island in the Caribbean called Puerto Rico. Um, in that island, I really had uh, some great influences. Uh, two of those were the ocean and the mountains. I was constantly uh, inspired by, by those two things. And at that moment of my life, I knew that I wanted to do something conservation related. I didn't really know what conservation was, but I wanted I wanted to help animals. So I decided to leave the island when I was about 18 years old to go to college at Iowa State University, uh, very close to you all, and got my degree in animal ecology with a pre-vet and wildlife care option. Um, at that point, I decided that I wasn't going to go to veterinary school. I really thought that that was the path that I wanted to take, but I learned that there were so many other things that I could do to help animals. So I decided to become a zookeeper and animal care specialist. And I have had the honor and pleasure of working with a diverse range of species from sea lions and seals, uh, otters, eagles, you name it. I've probably had the honor of working with them. But then I decided to transition over to what I do today, which is education, really inspiring younger generations to, to be the difference that we need to protect species like the Southern resident killer whale. So I always like to start our presentations with a little bit of foundation work, just kind of exploring what is a mammal. So I encourage you guys to use the chat or use the Q&A box and kind of tell me what are five characteristics that we as mammals, humans are also mammals have, um, and that will help us really understand a little bit more about the Southern resident killer whales. So you guys are more than welcome to put it on the chat. And if you have no idea, that is, completely okay. That is what you are here to do is to learn about all these different things. So I'll start with the first one and we'll see what, what comes through. But the first one is hair. Good job, Jennifer. Um, the first one is hair. All mammals have hair. And some of you might say, well, Adriana, I am here to you're, you're here to talk about Southern resident killer whales. Um, well, I want you guys to know that when dolphins are born, they actually have little whiskers on their rostrum and those are there to help mom, uh, baby find mom. And they do sh fall 
off shortly after birth, but it's really amazing that these animals do have hair, even though it's not the first thing that we think about. Jennifer also put on the chat mammary glands. Yes, mammals are able to produce uh, milk, which is really good. Let me go ahead and see. I see some coming in. Uh, yes, let's see, what else? Um, we all have lungs. We all breathe air. And that air is really important. Some people think that mammals and marine mammals specifically actually get water in their blowhole. And that's not true. Um, they do have lungs just like us. And they do need to come to the surface of the water. They do an exhale first to make sure that there's no water on top of their blowhole because we've all had water go down the wrong pipe hole and it's very uncomfortable. So for marine mammals, they do a big exhale first to make sure that there's no water on that blowhole. And then they go ahead and do their their inhale and continue their dive. Another characteristic of a mammal is that we thermoregulate, we are warm blooded. Our body is able to control our body temperature versus a reptile that would have to sit on a rock and absorb the rays of sunshine. We produce milk, you guys already put that on the chat. Great job. And last but not least, we have live birth. So here you have a picture of a little baby dolphin being born. They come out with that tail first, that tail becomes solid. And then mom is able to do a big push and then carries that baby to the top of the, of the water surface. So that baby is able to take a good inhale um, and, and is able to survive. All right, so now I want you guys to think about what is a marine mammal. There is a diverse group of marine mammals that live in our oceans. And more, more likely than not, we normally think about only one group and that's gonna be our cetaceans. Those are our whales, our dolphins and our porpoises. But there is other animals that are considered marine mammals and that's because they depend on the ocean in order to survive. So we have the Sirenians, uh, those are gonna be our manatees and our dugons. We have our mustelids, those will be our sea otters, our pinnipeds, which will be our walruses, seals, and sea lions. And last but not least, we have our ursidae. Our ursidae will be our polar bears because they do depend on the ocean in order to survive. Um, can anyone tell me what is the first thing that comes to your mind when you think about endangered species? What is something, maybe a species, or what does it mean to be endangered? Um, so go ahead and put it in the chat and I'll go ahead and let you know. What is an endangered species? Not many left, good job. So endangered species is a species that is endangered of going extinct. So their population is, is quickly dropping um, and we don't have a lot of them left in the wild. And more often than not, we do think about a wide variety of species that are terrestrial animals that are endangered. We have our pandas or cheetahs or tigers or elephants, uh, but a lot of different marine mammal species are, are also endangered. And here we have, as part of NOAA, they created a species in the spotlight. And these are different species uh, that live in the ocean that are endangered. And here we have the animal that we'll be focusing this presentation on, which is the Southern resident killer whale. And to connect the dots real quick, one of the thing that the Southern resident killer whale eats is salmon, most specifically um, your Chinook salmon, which is also endangered. So we'll go ahead and talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but I want you guys to start connecting those dots on different threats that are affecting the Southern resident killer whale in particular. So let's talk about Southern resident killer whales. Um, but first, before we go to that specific group, we have to talk about the Orcinus orca. Orcinus orca is your orcas. Um, there is different groups of orcas that are in that in that family, but they're the largest member of the dolphin family. And I don't know if you guys know that, but they are the largest member of the dolphin family. So there is dolphins, there is whales, but for the Southern resident killer whale and killer whales, they are considered a dolphin. And, and we'll go a little bit more in depth. Uh, orcas are found in every single ocean around the world and they use echolocation in order to hunt and communicate with other counterparts. 
And here you can see a good map of all the different areas in which you can find orcas, but we will be focusing, like I said, on the Southern resident killer whale. And I have another map which shows you guys is specifically where these animals are found. The main difference about resident killer whales and what we normally think about orcas is that they actually don't eat mammals. They only eat fish. And something like the transient killer whales, which is another group of, of orcas, they eat mammals. And those are the ones that we more likely think about when we think about killer whales or orcas is, is those videos of them eating other mammals. But that is not the only type. We do have ones that specifically eat salmon. Physically, they do look different. And the way by, that you can identify them is by looking at their saddle patch, which is the area right behind their dorsal fin. You can see that there is this notch right here on that saddle patch compared to the saddle patch of a transient killer whale, it doesn't have that notch. And that is one of the ways that researchers and scientists are able to tell them apart by just looking at these animals. So now we've talked a little bit about what they eat, but where do they live? Well, these guys are, for me, I live in, in San Diego. So these guys are our Northern neighbors for you guys in Illinois. Um, they would be in what we call the Pacific Northwest. So we can find them around Washington, Alaska, the Salish Sea, the Puget Sound, all of those different names are, are areas in which you can find Southern resident killer whales. And these guys live in pods and group of families. And there's actually three different pods of Southern resident killer whales. And we have J, K, and L. And those are different family groups. They tend to stay together. You do have males that kind of leave that pod, interact with others. But those are the three main pods of Southern resident killer whales. Again, the J, the K, and the L. And unfortunately for, for this population, their numbers have decrease, been decreasing. We can see it in this chart very well, how that number is slowly but surely starting to decrease. Um, and unfortunately, at this point, um, and this, these numbers are constantly changing. They are estimates. Um, there is an organization out there called the Center of Whale Research. And they go out every single summer and they do population surveys. They see how the population is doing. And at the moment, we have 73 individuals out there. 24 of those members are in the J pod. 16 of those members are in the K pod. And 33 of those members are in the L pod. Um, so there you have a little bit of information of where those animals are coming. Um, now we have to talk about threats. What is happening to these animals? Why are these numbers going down so exponentially? Where are they going and what is happening to them? The first one is the lack of food. Uh, I first showed a picture of the Chinook salmon and other species of salmon that are also endangered um, as species in the spotlight. And unfortunately, these animals don't have enough food to be able to survive and really maintain that population balance uh, between both species. So first we really have to understand the food that they eat. What is affecting their food and why is their food endangered? Um, so let's talk a, little, talk a little bit very quick about salmon and, and salmon biology. Um, here we have a smalt which uh, the adult may, the, the female will lay eggs, the eggs will grow and then you have the smalt. But what happens to that smalt? After those eggs hatch, that smolt has to travel over to the ocean. They live about seven years in the ocean and then they return back to lay their eggs. Um, but unfortunately, humans have added something to the rivers um, that don't allow them to get to the oceans and those are dams. And vice versa, the same thing is affecting these animals. When the adult is ready to go home, they're able to follow those scents that they followed as a young smolt, and they have to return back to those rivers to be able to lay their eggs and keep that cycle going. 
unfortunately, again, it's very hard for those adult salmon to reach some of those rivers um, because of the dams. And, and that is one of the main things that is affecting the population of salmon. Um, and Chinook salmon is one of the most often uh, fish that these animals are eating, but they're also eating other animals. So let me ask you guys this, what happens if the salmon cannot make it to the ocean and vice versa, what happens if the salmon can't make it back up the stream? You guys can, again, drop it in the chat and we'll see what you guys think or maybe start putting solutions. What are potential solutions um, that you guys can think about for, for solving this problem? What do you guys think? So yes, unfortunately for these animals, if they're not able to make it to the ocean, they can't uh, meet other salmon and reproduce them. And they can't make it up the stream, they can't lay those eggs. And if those legs are not laid, unfortunately these animals cannot thrive in their ecosystem. And it's not only the Southern resident killer whale that depends on the salmon. We have bald eagles, we have bears, even us depend on salmon and even trees. Uh, believe it or not, depend on those salmons to be able to survive and for that ecosystem to, again, be on, be on balance. So I have this video that talks a little bit more about different solutions that people have tried to do in order to help the salmon population. So check it out. For decades, wild salmon advocates have claimed the only way to bring back the Snake River salmon is to remove the dams. Many alternatives have been tried, or at least proposed. Spilling juvenile fish over dams, barging them around, building fish ladders for adults to swim past dams. There have even been a few stranger alternatives. In the 1970s, managers briefly flew fish in airplanes and dropped them into the water past the dams. More recently, a company is experimenting with what's been dubbed the salmon cannon. It's like a water slide, but for fish. But a federal judge recently concluded that removing dams may be the only solution and cleared the way for the government to study what that might mean. So there you have, they have even made these ladders um, and these slides in order to help the salmon to get to that place. But unfortunately, we're still changing a little bit of that ecosystem. So it's, we're still not there. We still haven't found that solution that will solve the problem of the salmon. The other threat that uh, marine mammals and the southern resident killer whale is facing is noise pollution. Uh, like I said earlier, southern resident killer whales and other dolphins depend on echolocation in order to be able to move throughout their environment. And because we have so many ships around um, and other machinery that is creating noise like drilling in the ocean, the ocean is becoming very, very loud and these animals can't use their echolocation as effectively to move throughout their environment um, or to even find one another or find their food. So here you have a cool um, illustration. Maybe you also don't know how echolocation works. Well, these animals have their melon, which is their forehead region. They go ahead and produce sound waves from that forehead region, which travels through the ocean, similar to when we are in a cave and we say, hello, our voice travels throughout that cave. It hits the wall. It returns back to us in the form of echo. Uh, but we don't get a lot of information about our surroundings like bats or whales or dolphins would. They actually know how many animals are around, how far they are, how large they are, um, which is really, really interesting. They absorb it through their bottom jaw. It connects to their brain. It connects to their ear. And they're able to paint a clear picture about their surroundings. So I'm going to go ahead and play this video. Uh, this is a video uh, of the Thank you. Um, but that is how animals are, are using their echolocation to move throughout their environment. Um, and let me tell you, when you're in the water with any of these animals and they're using echolocation, you can feel those vibrations inside of you. It's really cool. Um, but that's, that's one of my... Um, 
So I'm seeing is a whistle different for every dolphin, like a fingerprint. Yes. For, for some dolphins, they do have unique whistles and the whistles are the ones that are being produced from the blowhole, um, not from the melon, but yes. And in, in that video, you could hear her at the end doing her signature whistle and also her excitement whistle, like, Oh my God, yes, I did the right job. I get, um, I get this amazing fish. So dolphins and, and whales, you can hear them using their whistles and you can, um, from it, extrapolate how kind of the excitement that they're, that they're feeling, which is really, really cool. All right. So now we're going to go to contaminants, which is the last threat that is affecting the Southern resident killer whales. And unfortunately for these animals, they are, they're the top predator, right? They're in the top of that food chain. And for them, they store these toxins in their blubber, which means that when they don't have enough food to eat, they're going to use their blubber as a method to be able to survive. But unfortunately, that blubber might contain a lot of different contaminants. So now not only they're using their fat re reservoirs to be able to survive, they are using some of those contaminants that have been lodged in their fat areas. So what is happening? What does this mean? How are these Southern resident killer whales getting uh, contaminants in their blubber? Well, let's look at this image right here. Here we have us humans. We are dumping different chemicals into, into the water. Well, maybe those chemicals are not directly affecting the Southern resident killer whales, but we have smaller animals like phytoplankton, and these animals are eating or absorbing some of these contaminants. Then you have another level in, in, in the food chain and these animals are eating those smaller animals that have been compromised by those toxins. And slowly but surely they start, that starts accumulating or bioaccumulating in those particular animals' bodies. And once the Southern resident killer whale eats them, they have eaten a lot of salmon that has been contaminated. And maybe it doesn't affect them right away, but it goes straight into their blubber. And once that animal is one, either sick or is carrying a baby or a calf, that is when the problems are starting because they're passing those contaminants to the calf if they're pregnant or when they are don't have enough food then they're passing those contaminants straight into them and in their fat reservoirs. So I've talked about the three different threats that affect these animals. I do want to play this video because it's really interesting to see it all together and acknowledge that some of you guys have probably never seen a Southern resident killer whale. I haven't. I've only seen transient killer whales in the wild. Well, let's go ahead and watch this video and you can see a little bit more about all the things that I have already talked about, um, but then we'll go into the positives and the different things that we can do to help save these species. Southern residents are amazing animals. They live in stable family groups. They use sound to communicate with each other and to find their food. Uh, Southern residents are fish eaters. They like Chinook salmon in particular. And they're just really unique parts of our culture here in the Pacific Northwest. Southern resident killer whales are endangered and their population level is the lowest we've seen in several decades. There's three main threats. We're not sure the whales are getting enough of their Chinook salmon prey to eat. The whales also use sound to find their food, and so vessels and sound in the environment can interfere with their ability to find prey. The whales have high levels of contaminants. Because they're such a small population, they're at risk for something like an oil spill or a disease outbreak that could affect the entire population. There's an active research program so we can learn more about how these threats are affecting the whales and inform conservation and management actions to address those threats. We're using passive acoustic monitors in the environment to understand how the whales are using that habitat. We can also use digital acoustic tags and those tags help us understand the whale's behavior, how they're diving, how they're responding to sound and vessels in their environment, and how that might impact 
their foraging activity. We're using drones to take aerial photos of the whales. We can look at their body condition and see if they're getting enough to eat. We can also tell if females are pregnant. We can collect scales and tissue from the prey that they're eating. And we can also get breath samples and understand pathogens that might be causing disease for the whales. And then there's killer whale poop. By collecting samples, following behind the whales, we're able to learn about what they're eating. We can get genetics of the salmon as well as the individual whales. We can also learn about hormones and contaminants. Uh, killer whale poop has a wealth of information. Southern residents have been identified as a species in the spotlight because of their population decline as well as their high risk for extinction. Some of the new initiatives that have come out of this program are, are partnerships at the Canadian level with the state of Washington and at the local level. Priority actions include increasing critical prey for the whales, understanding what's causing problems with their health and their reproduction. I'm hopeful that there is a chance for recovery of southern resident killer whales. They're such an essential element of our ecosystem. And if we can all work together to support recovery, they can once again thrive as part of the food web and the ecosystem that we all share into the future. So there you have it. Um, and this goes a little bit more in depth into all the different science that is being utilized uh, to, to get to learn this, this population a little bit more. Um, we have different workshops that focus most, more specifically on them, like drone science and bioacoustics. Um, but I definitely won't dive very deep into that because I know you guys will have a lot of questions. Um, about that throughout the presentation. So I wouldn't have had enough time to talk about all those different types of sciences that are that are being used to further get to know this animal. So I'm seeing a couple of questions. Um, how do you get a breast sample from whales? It's actually really cool nowadays they're using drones. Um, so they use those drones, they will fly them over um, the blowhole and that water spout. And once that, uh, southern resident killer whale or really any other marine mammal is able to take that big exhale you have all of this snot that's coming out of that blowhole and then you grab that drone you fly it back to the boat and then you send it all of those uh, that snot over to the laboratory something that's really interesting about marine mammals is that they don't have the same uh, mucus glands and nasal hairs that we have in order to protect our lungs. So that video was talking about oil spills. If marine mammals are affected or impacted by an oil spill, they don't really have anything to protect them um, from those water droplets. That oil might, nest, might be completely going into their lungs just because that is not how they have been built. But that is one of the ways that we are able to take breath samples. Um, from those whales. All right, I am seeing, yes, there it is true. Um, you can find uh, whale poop using dogs. Dogs have been trained to smell uh, the salmon and the salmon oil in, in the poop and tell you exactly where that whale is. And then the scientists and researchers go out there and grab that whale poop. Uh, I know I'm gonna miss some questions, but I'll go back to all of them throughout um, towards the end of the presentation. So let's talk some positive. We've, we've learned about the threats of these animals. We, we've learned about their decline, but let's learn about a species recovery plan, which is exactly what these animals have entered uh, right now. We're trying and working very, very hard to, to recover this species. And you might be like, well, there's only 73 of them left. How do we do that? Well, NOAA Fisheries developed this final recovery plan for southern resident killer whales to identify and address the threats of this species. And this is something that has been done with other species out there that were uh, quickly and exponentially lowering in the amount of animals that were left. And now these animals are doing pretty good in their ecosystem and environment. Uh, an example was the gray whales. The gray whales for a very long time, they were hunted for their blubber. Um, and unfortunately, their population started to go down. 
they decided to put a species recovery plan into effect, and then these animals started to rise. The California condor, there was only, there was a very, very, very small amount of these animals left, and they brought them into a zoological facility in which they were taking care of those chicks and making sure that they were surviving into adulthood and then releasing them back into the wild. Now these animals are thriving out there. And then same for elephant seals. These animals were hunted for a very long time and a species recovery plan was put into effect and now the species is doing well. So what can you do? A lot of this is, well, Adriana, how does this affect me? I don't live in Washington. These animals are not around me. How does this affect me? Well, guys, I have never seen a Southern resident killer whale in my life, but I'm very passionate about making sure that future generations have the honor of having these animals around and thriving. And a lot of these things are not only affecting this particular group of animals, but it's also affecting a lot of other marine mammals in our oceans. And it is our job to get involved and create solutions that are meaningful enough that can create change. So here is the name of several organizations that are working on either salmon restoration or directly working with Southern resident killer whales to try to, to save those numbers and, and bring those numbers up. Reduce your water waste. I know we've all learned about this throughout our life, but this one's really important um, because if we can reduce our water waste, we can ensure that those rivers are there for these salmons to climb and, and be able to get to where they need to and lay their eggs. Uh, be the voice for the Southern resident killer whales. You all have shown up today and you are all here passionate about learning about these species and all of the other topics, uh, but use your voice. Start telling other people about these species, about why it's important to know that they are endangered and different ways that we can, can save them and continue helping them. So there is, that's about the presentation. Um, if you guys want to follow along with the National Marine Mammal Foundation, here I have our, our different social media links that you are more than welcome to follow us. And I will go ahead and pass it over back to our amazing host to, to ask me some questions that, are see, that I see that are coming through um, and go from there. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Is that okay? Yes, Perfect. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, where did you guys go? There you are. Okay, sorry. Sorry. There we go. <laughs> um, all right. So I'm starting to get started with some questions. Um, do the contaminants that biomagnify only dissolve in fats, or can this happen with chemicals that dissolve in water too? So it can happen in both. So if they're dissolving in water, um, they're still being absorbed by the fish, right? It's still affecting those, those smaller fish and smaller individuals. So once it gets to the, the whale, it's still affecting that whale um, in, in other ways. Um, how do you get a breath sample from whales? So I did talk a little bit about that. They use that drone um, and that is all brand new science. So for the drone specifically, it was something that was started with the military using drones for different things. And now they're being applied for science and conservation. And that's really helping us not only get breast samples from whales, but also do population estimates, being able to see from above if a female is pregnant, being able to do photogrammetry. Um, so we we are able to use drones in a lot of different ways right now. And one of those is, is doing breast samples and, and catching those. So during the first day of the teach-in, we learned about the larger right and blue whales and how they're impacted by ship strikes. Do killer whales have the same issue? Yes, absolutely. So ship strikes is not one of their number two threats at the moment. Um, but yes, the, the ship strikes does have the potential of also affecting that that population as well. Um, so then what do you think about the whales at SeaWorld? So for me specifically, um, this this program is all about the conservation of wild um, 
killer whales, right? So I am here to talk a little bit more about that focus because that is my focus. I focus on conservation of wild marine mammals and not necessarily the ones that are under human care. And then is it easier or harder helping marine species rather than land species? Well, kind of think about that. I, I definitely encourage you guys to think, why would it be harder to track a marine mammal? And, and that's because we can't always keep eyes on them, right? For a very long time, the science and the technology wasn't 100% there. Even when you're using a satellite tag, that satellite tag has to come to the top of the water surface and connect with the satellite for us to be able to track it. That's why we as scientists still don't know very much about sharks. But um, the technology has slowly been developing for us to learn about marine mammals, but there is still so a lot of different programs and things that we have to do um, in order to learn more about these animals. But being in the science field, especially specifically in the marine mammal conservation field, it's really interesting because that technology is constantly improving and developing. And then how fast can whales swim? Mm, I'm not 100% sure about that one. Not 100% sure. And then um, are orca pods territorial? Um, will they attack each other? And if so, um, how often does that happen? Uh, I believe that they are not territorial in the way we're, we're, let's talk about just southern resident killer whales. If we are thinking about different orcas and the transients versus the, the southerns, then it becomes more convoluted. But if we're just talking and thinking about the southern resident killer whales, they do mix and match and they do move around and socialize with different individuals um, throughout their, their ecosystem. All right, and then how do oil spills accept, affect sea mammals, especially larger ones like killer whales? Yeah, so for a very long time, it was believed that marine mammals would leave an area after an oil spill. And the National Marine Mammal Foundation was, was actually part of a big research study that happened after the Deepwater Horizon oil spill that happened about, um, at this point, to almost 12 years ago. And it was that mentality, well, an oil spill happens, the marine mammals will leave. And it was learned that they don't actually leave. They will stay around and it will affect them in, in different ways. You have that contact or direct contact with the oil to their skin. Their skin is very sensitive. Um, then you have them inhaling those oil droplets into their lungs. That's also affecting them. And then you have the long-term repercussions that affect not only the reproductive system, but also the respiratory system. And then have there any, oh, sorry. Have there been any wins recently for Southern residents? any wins. Um, there has been sightings of different females that have been pregnant. Um, unfortunately, one of the problems that we are seeing is that some of these calves are not making it into adulthood. Um, and some of that is cor correlated with the contaminants, right? These babies are, are being raised in the placenta of, this, of these mammals, and they are receiving a lot of that contaminant load from the mom that maybe has been, uh, been absorbed for many, many years. So then they're dumping that into the calves and the calves are not surviving very, very long. Right. And then with the pandemic going on, has COVID affected your research with the whales at all? So our research, we don't necessarily do the research directly with Southern resident killer whales. Uh, but unfortunately, with the pandemic, a lot of the things that have been observed is even the, the field research has been put on hold um, because the researchers can't go out there, right? They still, we're still <laughs> in a pandemic. Um, so the researchers are not going out there. So as we continue to move forward, we are going to see a, a data gap in, in the last couple of years um, because no one has been out there or not the same amount of researchers have been out there collecting data. And then it seems like working to save ocean mammal populations, you really have to improve water quality and then all of the organisms they need to eat is our thinking right. 
Yeah. So um, water quality is one of them. Um, how the 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 organisms are 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 thriving in that. Um, but really plastic pollution, not only the water quality, but how much we are putting into the oceans when it comes to contaminants and plastic pollution. Plastic pollution um, is a really big one right now that is affecting all marine mammals, not, not just the Southern resident killer whales. Do you have a favorite scientist or just someone who inspired you heavily to get into this? Um, I, I really admire, um, I started with David Attenborough, which I don't know if you guys know who David Attenborough is, but he does a lot of the nature documentaries. And that one was a way of me growing up in a little island, or even when I lived in Iowa, that I didn't have the ocean, I could just be teleported into the depths of the ocean and let a, learn a little bit more. But I do truly admire our executive director, um, Dr. Cynthia Smith. She is a veterinarian and she has been doing incredible conservation work um, with species like the vaquita porpoise in Baja, California. Do you have a favorite ocean experience you could share with us? Yes, yes. So a couple of months ago, um, I per normally participate in a research trip um, to go over to the Farallon Islands to, to look at great white sharks. And that last this last past year in October, we went out there and this humpback whale, we saw him, we're like, oh, cool, humpback whale, let's put our boat in neutral because that's what you're supposed to do when you see um, any marine mammal because they're protected by the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And I kid you guys not, this whale hung out with us for over an hour, um, just checking the boat, just checking all of us. And I have worked with marine mammals for a very long time, but getting to see eye to eye with a humpback whale and, and seeing how much we are observe, observing them, but he was also observing us and what we were doing and our reactions and, and getting a kick out of our excitement was really amazing. And then we finally were like, okay, we have to go over to the Farallons because we're here to look for sharks. And as we started driving away, this whale started jumping and what we call breaching. And, and it was really beautiful because when you spend your life taking care of these animals to get to actually see these animals and, and have that, that very special interaction with them was, was incredible and something that I'll never forget looking into the eyeball of a humpback whale as they're looking into us. Um, if math is a subject you struggle with, is marine science still a good like major job? Absolutely. Don't let math and the, the fear that we have for math stop you. I promise you, I was not good at math. I definitely let that fear um, hold me back at times. But the biggest thing is that is a what is it? one semester of your life. Just pass your class, get a passing grade. Don't don't lose hope because you can't pass your math or even your organic chemistries. That is just a little part of your career and you won't be using math in, in the bigger sense unless you're a population or a statistics um, researcher. And do underwater acoustic explorations appear to harm the Southern resident whales? No, so they are, are letting us get to know them a little bit better. So our team does a lot of bioacoustic research, really learning how these animals are affected by, by the overall sound of the ocean. So no, bioacoustic research is really, really important to be able to understand these animals because they depend on sound so much to be able to move through their ecosystem, to find other mates, and to be able to find their food. And then how do things like storms or bad storms and natural disasters affect whales? I'm not 100% sure how, how they directly affect whales. I'm not 100% sure about that. I'll, I'll have to do a little bit more research on that one to really see if there is a correlation between one or the other. And then um, do whales have a social class in their pods? Yeah, so whales um, are matriarchs. 
um, which means that the females are the ones that are, are in charge. And it's also interesting because whales are one of the only species aside from humans that exhibit menopause. So we have older females that are, are done through their reproductive cycle, they've had calves, they go into menopause, but they're still the leaders of that pod. They're in charge of, of teaching those younger animals uh, different behaviors that need to be known for those that group to survive, where to go, how to move throughout their environment. So they're what we call matriarch societies. And then have there any have there been any setbacks in your career that actually helped like you further down the line when researching the whales? What was that? I'm sorry, go ahead again. Has there been any setbacks in your career that have actually helped you further in the line in your research? Ah, uh, setbacks. I think that I always say anything that is worth it is going to have some setbacks. It's going to have some things that push you a little bit back, but keep your determination, keep moving forward, keep your eyes on, on the price and, and don't let that, those step backs um, stop you. For me particularly, I don't do direct research. So I'm not out there collecting numbers or, or trying to see an individual and spend hours not seeing. I, a lot of my colleagues had that during the vaquita research and going out to the Sea of Cortez trying to find the vaquitas, but they still kept pushing forward to find a solution. So don't let setbacks set you back because you always have to continue going forward. Um, can you talk more about the Nikitas and how like that also impacts your research? Yes. So the vaquita porpoises are the most endangered marine mammal. Um, at the moment, newest numbers are saying there's about seven to 10 individuals left in the wild. Um, they're being affected because of something called gill nets. And gill nets are these really big nets that go into the Sea of Cortez, and they're there to catch another endangered species that's called a totuaba. The totuaba has a swim bladder and a swim bladder is an organ that sharks and fish have that control the buoyancy of these animals in the water column. So what's happening is that the Tuaba are being fished because it's believed that, that that swim bladder has medicinal values to it. Um, but unfortunately for the vaquita that lives in the same environment, they are mammals. And what happens when they get entangled in a gill net, they can't see it using their echolocation. They swim forward, they get entangled, they can't really back up. And because they breathe air, we are losing a lot of vaquitas this way. Um, and there is a lot of research being done and a lot of policies created in order to try to save this, this species. But seven to 10 left at the moment. And then how do you get comfortable with working in the ocean and with these animals that many people believe is dangerous? Oh, uh, how do you get comfortable? I, I think that for me, I've always had that passion for being in the ocean and having my sea legs. And that's my happy place. Like when I am in the ocean, I'm not really worried about what might happen in a negative sense. I am there because it is my passion to be in the ocean. It is my passion to get to see these animals. It doesn't matter how many times I get to see a dolphin out there. It's still incredibly excited. And then even more excited when you see an orca or a humpback whale or a blue whale. I don't normally get fear at that point. Um, it's excitement. But if you do have anything like this, just start with your slow approximations. Maybe you're scared of water, start in your shallow water at home, at, at, the, at a pool and start getting comfortable because really the fear of water or fear of these animals is something that has been taught to us, but really something that can also be overcome if you expose yourself um, to it enough time and start practicing your scuba diving and your, your swimming to get more comfortable in that. And then, so how do you tell gender um, of whales? Yes, that's a great question. So by looking at them, um, some of them are a little larger than others, but that's not the scientific way of doing it. 
you can do it by two ways. The physical way of seeing them is when you look at a whale's stomach um, in their genital slit area, a female is going to have a division sign and it's going to look like this. These small dots on the side are going to be the mammary glands because again, they are mammals. So a division sign is for a female and then an exclamation point is for a male. We can also do blood samples and things like that, but most often than not, they do physical. So if that whale is doing a breach and you can take a quick picture of that genital slit, we're normally able to determine the sex of that animal. And then are whales colorblind? Are whales colorblind? There is still a lot of research that's being done about how animals and marine mammals are able to see, but they do have different um, cones that don't allow them to see color the same way. Um, it's believed that the color that they're most often able to see is your blue colors. And that does make sense because you do lose a lot of those colors when you are deep diving in the ocean. And then you did talk about you being from Iowa a little bit earlier. So how do like how do people in like Midwest states um, help with this and like research on their own since we can't be by the ocean? Yes. So first, use your voice. I, I am not from Iowa. I'm from Puerto Rico, but I spent seven years in Iowa. Um, that's where I went to school and I I wanted to go to school for marine biology or or anything that re like was associated with the ocean and then I was in Iowa but I had some incredible experiences while I was at Iowa State the main thing that I can tell you guys is is do what you're doing right now you're here you're present you're learning use your voice to inspire other people to protect these animals shop locally if you have a, a local store instead of having to get things shipped to you you are able to just go and support a local business and that will start cutting on, on that shipping noise that, that comes from really all over the United States when things are being shipped and, and reduce your plastic ways, keep on learning. And if you have any other questions, you are more than welcome to always reach out to us at the foundation and we would be more than happy to answer any of those questions. And then how many babies can a whale have at once? At once, normally one. It is not very normal for um, marine mammals to, to take care of more than one individual because it requires a lot of, of energy for those animals to do so. And they stay with that calf for such a prolonged period of time that, that normally it's one. Animals always have an exception, um, but one is, is the rule of thumb. And then do orcas migrate? Yeah, so different orcas will exhibit different behaviors for the southern resident killer whales specifically. We have seen them come over into southern California, but it's not very often, but they still move around through the Salish Sea and the Puget Sound up to Alaska and down to um, the Washington coast. Did I lose you guys? Oh, we, their computer just crashed. Oh, they're back. Here they come. Um, I'm seeing, is there any invasive species that are affecting whales currently? I'm not hundred percent sure about that. Um, when it comes to invasive species, that's, that's not of their main threats. So I'm not a hundred percent sure if there is any invasive species that is currently, um, affecting these populations. Welcome back ladies. Uh, sorry about that. I don't know why that happened. Um, all right. I think we have a couple more questions that we can ask. Yeah. So how do the indigenous people of the Northwest help with whales? Um, I don't have a specific answer to that. Um, it's definitely something that I'm learning about a lot in, in recent months. Um, but the, the indigenous people do have 
a, a big cultural correlation and connection to these animals. Um, so it is part of their culture to protect these animals and, and all of that, but I'm not 100% sure what they are doing that is connecting all the dots. Then this looks like this will be our last question of the day today. Um, are there any invasive species that are affecting whales currently? I answer that one while you guys were on your technical issues. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, okay, well, there's actually one more. Do plants affect water quality at all? They can. Um, so you have things like your algae blooms uh, that can affect your water quality. So that's another factor that can um, affect these animals. But like I said, it's not one of those main threats and one of the main things that they're focusing their attention on when they're when they're trying to save the species. Well, I think that is all the questions we have then. Um, well, thank you so much for coming here. We really do appreciate it. We love getting new people coming in and talking, especially helping a cause as someone as passionate as you are. And we really do hope that next year you will be joining us again and talking even more. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you all for having yeah. me, for joining us, and let us know if we can do anything else to help you all. Thank you. Thank you.